the stars are right, and that means it's time for another episode of The Whisper in Darkness. I'm your host, The Man from Lang. Thank you very much for joining me today. On this episode, we are barnstorming with Arkham's aviatrix, Winifred Habamuck, the rogue investigator released in the Investigator Starter Deck product. I'll share my thoughts on Winifred, explore her viability in the multiplayer and solo formats, and examine some of the player cards that are included in her starter deck. By the end of this video, I hope that you'll be better prepared to impress your friends with your piloting skills as Winifred flies through scenarios. There are spoilers throughout if you care about that sort of thing. If you enjoy what you hear, remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Will Winifred's aerobatics impress players, or will they leave them reaching for their air sickness bags in front of their seats? Let's find out. Before we get started, I'd like to thank the patrons of this channel for their tremendous support. The Arkham Horror LCG community is amazing, and these people have gone above and beyond to bring you content like these starter deck reviews. If you'd like to support the channel's goals and see your name on this list, head over to Patreon.com, sign up for a tier of your choice, and claim your rewards. That would be awesome. Special thanks to Cole Monroe Chitty for the amazing art that graces the channel, Nicole Fiscus for the new Whisper in Darkness logo that graces the podcast, and Nate Lost in Time and Space for the overlays as well as the intro. Thank you very much. I couldn't do it without you. Without further ado, let's get started. To the best of my knowledge, Winifred Habamock is the first Native American represented in the Arkham Horror Files product line. While the character of Winifred Habamock is fictional, she is likely based on African American and Native American aviation pioneers such as Bessie Coleman, known as Brave Bessie, and Ola Mildred Rexroad. Coleman and Riddle got their start as stunt flyers in the 1920s and 1930s. Rex Rote was the only Native American woman to serve in the Women's Air Force Service Pilots, where she was assigned the dangerous job of towing targets for aerial gunnery students. Talk about bravery. Towing a target behind you while a bunch of newbie gunners take pot shots at you seems like a surefire way to get shot down. All three women went on to inspire other pilots in the African American and Native American communities. Designer Maxine Newman has been at the forefront of prom promoting diversity and inclusion in gaming, and I applaud her for creating an investigator like Winifred. On a personal note, I have a soft spot for Winifred since that was my grandmother's name. Winifred Habamock the Aviatrix has 1 Willpower, 3 Intellect, 3 Combat, and 5 Agility. She has the Criminal Trait, 8 Health, and 7 Sanity. She has the following free triggered ability. If two different non-weakness cards you control are committed to this skill test, draw one card, limit once per test. Her Elder Sign ability is plus one. After this test ends, for every two points you succeeded by, return a card you committed to this test to your hand. Let's deal with the elephant in the hangar first, Winifred's awful willpower. You'd expect a stunt pilot to have nerves of steel, but uh, not Winifred. Perhaps she had one too many close calls while flying through turbulence, or perhaps her parachute didn't open correctly when she was forced to eject, because her nerves are shot, and every willpower treachery in the encounter deck can sense her fear. Whether you are playing Winifred in solo or multiplayer, odds are you are going to take a lot of the willpower treachery square on the jaw. Losing two or three sanity to rotting remains or the yellow sign is bad, but it's relatively easy for Winifred to soak that horror, it's the effects on some of the other willpower treacheries that really worry me. A poorly timed frozen in fear from the course that can clip Winifred's wings while Cryptchill will discard her prized assets. The combination of visions of future's past and arcane barrier from the Dunwich legacy will shred Winifred's draw deck so Beyond the Veil can deliver the killing blow. If Winifred sets foot in the jungle, lost in the wilds, voice of the jungle and terror in time will have her fleeing back to civilization where the nightmare that is the Circle Undone campaign awaits. There are so many dangerous willpower treacheries in that campaign that Winifred will need a supersized threat area to hold them all. There are several parlay actions that require willpower skill tests, and willpower skill tests also appear on agenda and act cards from time to time. Needless to say, Winifred will struggle to shake Dr. Morgan out of his days in The House Always Wins, make small talk with the party guests in The Last King, or discuss the historical significance of the Etsley with Harlan Ernstone, even if she compliments her aviator glasses with some fine clothes. Winifred's deck-building restrictions exacerbate her willpower problem, especially at level zero. Unlike rogues such as Finn Edwards, Preston Fairmont, Monterey Jack, and Triss Scarborough, who may draw on cards in the Seeker and or Survivor card pools to bolster their willpower, Winifred is restricted to the rogue and neutral cards, Unfortunately, neither card pool has much to offer Winifred in the willpower department at the beginning of a campaign. 
Cards such as Liquid Courage, Lonnie Ritter, and Smoking Pipe can help Winifred mitigate the impact of horror, but they do nothing to help her pass critical willpower skill tests. Guts, Tennessee Sour Mash, and Unexpected Courage can also help at level 0, but again, they don't really do enough on their own to get Winifred over the willpower hump, especially when the skill test difficulty creeps above 3. Money Talks is a viable option, but it depends on the number of resources in your resource pool, so it's not the most reliable card out there. That said, her options do improve once she's gained a few experience points. We'll take a closer look at a few ways to help Winifred overcome her low willpower later in this video. Winifred has an intellect skill value of 3, which is average. She's not particularly well suited to playing the role of a Kluver, at least not right out of the, out of the starter deck box. Lockpicks 0 is just one bad skill test away from breaking, while Streetwise and Pilfer have the potential to chew through Winifred's resources a lot faster than she can generate them. Winifred's starter deck doesn't have a ton of cards with intellect and or wild skill icons to commit to skill tests either. Winifred might have enough tools to play a supporting role in multiplayer, especially if there's a dedicated Kluver who can discover the lion's share of clues, but she will struggle in solo if she gets unlucky and breaks her lockpicks. If you're interested in playing Winifred as a Kluver in multiplayer or solo, then you'll need to beef up Winifred's ability to discover clues. Personally, I'm still a fan of Flashlight, Perception, and Unexpected Courage from the core set, while Intel Report from the Secret Name has become a staple in rogue, rogue decks for a good reason. Once Winifred earns some experience points, she can upgrade to Lockpicks level 1, which was reprinted in the revised core set, and hire Lola Santiago from the Heart of the Elders Mythos pack. There are several important parlay actions that require intellect skill tests, most notably Jazz Mulligan in Extracurricular Activity and Ichtaka in the Untamed Wilds. Winifred will need to commit cards and or spend resources to have any hope of passing them. If you're playing multiplayer, you're probably better off letting a more qualified investigator handle those tests. If you're playing solo, then you will need to keep an eye on your skill icons during deck construction. Fortunately, there are some good options in the rogue card pool, including the aforementioned Intel Report and Lula Santiago. If you've got the resources, either level of Streetwise, Moxie 3 from Edge of the Earth, and Cunning from the Circle Undone can put Winifred over the top. Winifred has a base combat skill value of 3, which is average. Winifred has a reasonable chance of killing a swarm of rats on standard difficulty, but she will need either a weapon or a bunch of combat and or wild skill lockdowns to take down some of the tougher agents of the mythos. Sadly, Winifred's starter deck comes up short in both departments. Switchblade Zero is among the worst rogue weapons in the game and really has no business being in Winifred's starter deck. At the very least, replace it with the 41 Derringer from the core set ASAP. The Mauser C96 combat and damage bonuses are solid, but Winifred must succeed by two on the skill test to fire it more than once per turn or generate a resource. That's not going to be easy with a base combat skill value of 3 and very few combat and or wild skill icons to boost it consistently above 4 or 5. If Winifred's in the market for a decent sidearm to keep enemies at bay, her options are limited at the beginning of a campaign. The 41 Derringer from the core set bumps Winifred's combat skill value to 5, but she must succeed by 2 to unlock the damage bonus, and we've already established that succeeding by 2 on combat skill tests isn't really Winifred's forte, at least not right out of the box. The 41 Derringer 2, which was reprinted in the revised core set, is a good upgrade for Winifred if she leans into the succeed by X mechanic. The 25 Automatic from the Innsmouth Conspiracy Deluxe Expansion is fast, and it has a slightly larger magazine and better combat and damage bonuses than the 41 Derringer, but those bonuses are limited to exhausted enemies. As we'll see in a moment, Winifred shouldn't have a problem evading enemies, but she's no Finn Edwards who gets a free evade action every turn. The fast keyword mitigates the 25 automatics drawback somewhat, but it is a more action-intensive combat option than either the Mauser C96 or the 41 Derringer. That said, the 25 automatic level 2 from the Into the Maelstrom Mythos pack is a good upgrade for Winifred, since she can piggyback the weapon's fight action on an evade action, all but eliminating the drawback. It is worth noting that either level of the 25 automatic synergizes well with Hatchet Man, a rogue skill from Boundary Beyond. If you commit Hatchet Man to a successful evasion attempt and follow up with a shot from the 25 automatic, you'll hit for 3 damage rather than just 2, which is important since many enemies these days sport 3 health. Winifred is capable of killing enemies if necessary, but she prefers to fly circles around them using her best skill, agility. 
At the time of her release, Winifred was only the second investigator in the game with five agility, the first being Reedy Young from the Circle Undone Deluxe Expansion. Since then, we've also received Monterey Jack, the rogue investigator in the Edge of the Earth Investigator Expansion. Unfortunately for Winifred, Rita, and Monterey, 5 Agility doesn't necessarily elicit the same oohs and ahs from players as 5 Willpower, 5 Intellect, or 5 Combat. When the core set was released, Agility was considered by some players to be the weakest skill in the game. Sure, there were a few encounter cards that required Agility skill tests, notably Grasping Hands, Locked Door, and On Wings of Darkness, but they were rare compared to encounter cards that required Willpower skill tests. Agility couldn't help you discover clues back then, so it couldn't compete with intellect. Agility also took a backseat to combat. Players preferred killing enemies to evading them because there were certain enemies, such as the Wizard of the Order from the core set, who were simply too dangerous to be left alive for more than a turn or two. Enemies with the Hunter keyword are also problematic to evade, since they will give chase eventually. Killing them outright is often a better choice, unless you're confident that you can run circles around them. And then there are the enemies worth victory points, which you really need to kill in order to upgrade your deck. Agility stock has gone up a lot over the past five years. For starters, there are more player cards besides Backstab that allow investigators to leverage their agility to discover clues and kill enemies. The introduction of enemies with Vengeance X in the Forgotten Age and the Swarm keyword in the Dream Eaters encourage players to rethink enemy management, and encounter cards that require agility skill tests are now second only to willpower. I think agility is still slightly less valuable than the other three skills, but the gap between them narrows with each expansion. But I digress. Winifred's amazing agility gives her a leg up against many agents of the mythos. Enemies tend to have slightly lower average evade than fight, so five agility goes a little further than five combat against some enemies. Long story short, there are very few enemies that will pose a serious threat to Winifred if she decides that retreat is the better part of valor. Winifred's 5 Agility also makes her an ideal candidate to leverage cards such as Lockpicks, Cheap Shot, and Breaking and Entering. Pilfer, which is included in Winifred's starter deck, is another option, albeit a very expensive one if you need to discover clues in those hard-to-reach places. Once Winifred has earned a few experience points, she can pick up Ornate Bow to leverage her agility in combat. However, it is worth noting that Ornate Bow requires two hand slots, and Winifred is probably wants to carry a set of Lockpicks. As I mentioned earlier, agility skill tests have become quite common on encounter cards, so if you need to break down a locked door, escape from a flooded theater in Curtain Call, or scout ahead deep below the earth in the depths of Yoth, Winifred's your girl. Apart from her agility, Winifred's base skill values are average to below average. Her special ability, on the other hand, is amazing. When Winifred commits two different non-weakness cards she controls to a skill test, she may draw one card as a free-triggered ability. Winifred may trigger this ability only once per test, however she may trigger it every test that she makes, potentially drawing herself one card during the Mythos phase and one card for every action she takes during her turn. Draw wins games in the Arkham Horror LCG and Winifred's ability is a huge boon. It is important to note that Winifred's ability fires during the free triggered ability window that opens after you commit cards to the skill test during step 2, so you can't commit the card that you drew with her ability to the skill test. Winifred's ability rewards her for committing more skill icons than necessary to skill tests. This tendency to overcommit skill icons naturally lends itself to the Succeed by X mechanic that appears on many cards in the Rogue card pool. The synergy between Winifred's special ability and the Succeed by X mechanic can produce some explosive results. For example, if Winifred plays Lockpicks level 1 in combination with Lucky Cigarette Case, which is included in her starter deck, she has the potential to draw at least two cards each turn if she succeeds by two, one from her special ability and one from the Lucky Cigarette case. If one of the cards she commits to the Intellect skill test during the Investigate action happens to be Perception from the core set, Winifred will draw an additional card if she succeeds. If Winifred commits Perception and Opportunist 2, a skill from the Undimensioned and Unseen Mythos pack, she has the potential to draw a total of three cards and return Opportunist 2 to her hand so she can commit it to the next skill test and draw herself yet more cards. Winifred has the potential to draw a lot of cards during Investigate actions, but she can top that if she leverages her free triggered ability while evading enemies. For example, if she plays Lucky Cigarette Case in combination with Pickpocketing from the core set, Winifred has the potential to draw three cards if she succeeds by two, one for her ability, one for the Lucky Cigarette Case, and one for Pickpocketing. 
Toss manual dexterity and opportunist two into the mix, and Winifred will draw a fourth card and return opportunist two to her hand to rinse and repeat the combination. And we haven't even discussed upgrading to Lucky Cigarette Case 3, which lets Winifred pick the card she wants to draw, Pickpocketing 2, which lets her draw a card and gain a resource, or Manual Dexterity 2, which lets her draw two cards instead of one. Winifred will be on Cloud 9 as those extra cards and resources add up during a scenario. Winifred's Elder Sign ability is plus one, and after the test ends, for every two points you succeed by, you return a card you committed to this test to your hand, it's impossible to predict when you'll draw an Elder Sign unless you're playing some flavor of Mystic who can dabble with Chaos Bag manipulation, so I don't put much stock in Elder Sign abilities. If they trigger, that's great, but it's not like I'm going to build my deck around them or anything. Winifred's Elder Sign ability is more conditional than others in the game because A, you have to have committed cards to the skill test in the first place, and B, you had to succeed by X to have any hope of getting those cards back. If you're playing Winifred, you should try to commit multiple cards to as many skill tests as possible, but sometimes that's just not possible. Inevitably, those are the skill tests when you draw an Elder Sign. That, or you commit a bunch of cards to the skill test and succeed by the skin of your teeth. Either way, you end up with nothing to show for the Elder Sign. I haven't kept track of how many Elder Signs that I've drawn while playing Winifred, but her Elder Sign ability hasn't been that memorable. I know for a fact that I've triggered it at least once, and it was pretty sweet when it happened, although I ended up with so many cards in my hand that uh, after the skill test I had to discard down to 8 cards during the subsequent upkeep phase. Winifred's signature card is anything you can do better. It's a rogue skill with 6 wild skill icons. It goes in Winifred Habamock deck only, and you may commit it only to a skill test you are performing. That's it. Winifred may be a barnstorming stunt pilot, but uh, you wouldn't know it by anything you can do better, which has got to be one of the most boring signature cards in the game. It's very difficult for me to get excited about a card that has only six wild skill icons, which is two to three times as many skill icons as you need for most skill tests on standard difficulty. Basically, you get to pass one, maybe two skill tests per game by a lot, and that's about it. Obviously, this skill synergizes with the Succeed by X mechanic and her Elder Sign ability, but absolutely killing it on one skill test doesn't really support the strategy as a whole. When I play Winifred solo, I usually end up committing anything you can do better to one willpower skill test that I really need to pass and move on. Here's hoping we get an Arkham Horror novella about Winifred sooner than later, so we can get a more interesting replacement signature card. Winifred's Airplane would be a cool addition to the game. Winifred's signature weakness is also a skill. Arrogance has one negative wild skill icon and the flaw trait. You must commit arrogance to each eligible skill test you perform. This skill's icon subtract from your skill value instead of adding to it. If this test succeeds, return this skill to your hand. If Winifred's signature card ranks among the most boring in the game, her signature weakness ranks among, well, the weakest in the game. Arrogance is a relatively minor nuisance that will linger in your hand until you fail a skill test, at which point it flies off to the discard pile. Fortunately, failing a single skill test is rarely a deal breaker, especially when it's relatively easy to arrange an intellect skill test to fail at a convenient time. If you get stuck with arrogance at an inopportune time, there's nothing stopping you from committing other cards to the skill test to counteract its negative skill icon. Winifred's ability rewards her when she commits at least two non-weakness cards to a skill test, so odds are you will still pass the skill test despite the negative icon on Arrogance. It's worth noting that if you prefer multiplayer, there's nothing stopping you from committing Arrogance to a skill test performed by another investigator at your location. If that investigator happens to be a survivor who can benefit from failing a skill test, you both win. Winifred's starter deck adds one weakness to the growing pool of basic weaknesses in the game. Reckless is a skill with the flaw trait. You may commit it only to a skill test you are performing of any type that has no other cards committed to it. Other cards cannot be committed to this skill test. If the skill test fails, return Reckless to your hand. It has the following forced effect. If Reckless is in your hand at the end of your turn, reveal it and lose two resources. I don't have a lot of experience playing against Reckless, but it's relatively tame compared to some of the other threats in the basic weakness card pool. Most investigators have at least one skill that is above average, so, so they should be able to unload Reckless by taking actions that they were probably going to take anyway. 
For example, Roland Banks has a combat skill value of 5 while armed with most level 0 weapons, 6 if he has a beat cop in play. Odds are that he can commit Reckless to a combat skill test against an average enemy on standard difficulty and still pass. Investigators with below average skill values, such as Calvin Wright, Preston Fairmont, and Amanda Sharp are the obvious exceptions. The last time I drew Reckless as a basic weakness, I just so happened to be playing Amanda, who was trapped in the body of a Yithian, and I was quite worried that I would never be able to discard it because Yithians have an average skill value of 2, and they're all about committing cards to skill tests. That said, it's important to remember that Reckless doesn't have that much impact on a skill test besides preventing you from committing other cards to it. For starters, you are un under no obligation to commit Reckless to a skill test. If there's a skill test that you absolutely positively need to pass, simply hang on to the Reckless and commit cards to the test as normal. That decision may end up costing you two resources, but you may not have any resources to lose in the first place, in which case Reckless does nothing. The other nice thing about Reckless is that, unlike Winifred's signature weakness, Arrogance, it doesn't subtract skill icons from your total skill value. Reckless doesn't prevent you from using other tricks to modify your total skill value either. For example, if you take the Investigate action using Flashlight and you're able to reduce the Shroud value to zero, you'll discard Reckless unless you draw an Autofail token. Rogues and off-class rogues equipped with lockpicks will be hard-pressed to fail intellect skill tests during investigative actions regardless of how reckless they've become. Other investigators can rig skill tests in their favor by using passive skill bonuses on assets, such as Cat Burglar, or spending resources to fuel talents, such as Hard Knocks from the core set. That's how I managed to discard Reckless while trapped in the body of a Yithian. Scientific method came in really handy. Honestly, unless you're playing an investigator with below average skill values, I wouldn't worry too much about Reckless. You might lose a couple of resources to it here and there, but you should be able to investigate, fight, or evade something within a turn or two of drawing it. Up to this point, we've analyzed Winifred's strengths and weaknesses and examined her signature cards. Now it's time to discuss the contents of her starter deck. To be perfectly frank, Winifred's starter deck is hot garbage. I know that sounds harsh, but the deck has four glaring weaknesses that make it very challenging for new players. Those weaknesses are as follows. A lack of focus, the succeed by X mechanic, resource generation, and card selection. Let's kick things off by discussing the deck's focus, or lack thereof. Love em or hate em, the Nathaniel Cho and Harvey Walter starter decks provide new players with clear plans of attack. Nathaniel, you have five combat. Kill all the monsters. Harvey, you have five intellect. Discover all the clues. I think you can make the argument that Nathaniel and Harvey are a little too focused on combat and investigation for their own good, but at least they have straightforward, coherent strategies that are relatively easy for new players to implement. The same can't be said for Winifred's starter deck. Given that Winifred has five agility, you'd expect her deck to focus on a strategy that leverages that skill, such as evasion. I could even see a deck focused on generating action advantage or piles of resources, both of which are well-established rogue archetypes. But Winifred's starter deck does neither of those things. Instead, it tries to fight, investigate, and evade, and ultimately fails to excel at anything. Winifred's starter deck might be okay in a 3- or 4-player game where it can discover clues or manage enemies as necessary. I'd hate to play it in 2-player, though. It simply doesn't have enough investigation or combat to really carry the load. The problems created by the deck's lack of focus are compounded by its attempt to leverage the Succeed by X mechanic. Decks based on the Succeed by X mechanic have been around since the core set, but they wouldn't be my first choice to give to a new player. There are a couple reasons for that. First, in my experience, the Succeed by X decks tend to be quite fragile at the beginning of a campaign because the engine that drives it is often fueled by the very success that it hopes to achieve. A Succeed by X deck will chug along quite happily if it can consistently succeed by X to leverage cards such as Lockpicks, 41 Derringer, Lucky Cigarette Case, and Opportunist. However, if the deck fails a few key skill tests and it can no longer discover clues with lockpicks, deal extra damage to enemies with the 41 Derringer, draw cards with the Lucky Cigarette Case, or Recycle Opportunist, the engine locks up and the deck, much like Winifred's plane, enters a nosedive that is very difficult to pull out of. Winifred's free triggered ability alleviates some of these issues by providing a steady stream of cards to commit to skill tests, 
but there are only so many intellect, combat, and agility skill icons to go around. More on that point in a moment. The second reason I wouldn't give a Succeed by X deck to a new player is that knowing how and when to succeed by X consistently requires an understanding of the chaos bag that, and probability that most new players simply do not have yet. If your strategy to discover clues hinges on lockpicks, then you really need to know the odds of them breaking. The same is true if Winifred's life depends on taking down a 4 health enemy with the Mauser C96. Calculating and recalculating the odds of success every time you pull from the Chaos Bag is a lot to ask of new players, especially with a game as complex as the Arkham Horror LCG. The Mauser C96 and its level 2 upgrade are good examples of how the deck's lack of focus, coupled with the Succeed by X mechanic, raises the barrier to entry for new players. The Mauser C96 is a 4 cost asset with the item, weapon, firearm, and illicit traits. It uses 5 ammo. As an action, you may exhaust the Mauser and spend 1 ammo to fight. You get plus 1 combat and deal plus 1 damage for the attack. If you succeed by 2, either ready the Mauser C96 or gain 1 resource. The presence of the Succeed by 2 clause on the Mauser C96 implies that it's possible to succeed by 2 with this weapon if you're playing Winifred. After all, why would the designers put the card in Winifred's deck if she couldn't trigger it? What's not immediately obvious is that it's actually quite difficult for Winifred to succeed by 2 with any sort of consistency out of the box while firing the Mauser. Let's look at an example. Assume for a moment that Winifred is fighting the Icy Ghoul from the Gathering. The Icy Ghoul has 3 fight and 4 health, which are typical stats for a mid-level enemy. If Winifred wants to kill the Icy Ghoul in one turn, she will need to take two fight actions with the Mauser C96. To do that, she must succeed by two on the first fight action to ready the Mauser. What are the odds of her succeeding? Well, we'll be charitable and assume that Winifred has Lonnie Ritter in play. Between the combat bonuses from Lonnie and the Mauser, Winifred has a combat skill value of 5, giving her an 81.25% chance of hitting the Icy Ghoul. However, Winifred's odds of succeeding by 2 to ready the Mauser for the second shot are only 25%. If Winifred wants to succeed by 2 consistently, then she needs to boost her combat skill value to at least 6, or better yet, 7. Winifred's deck doesn't contain any talents which she could use to boost her skill value by spending resources, so she'll have to commit some cards to the skill test. Unfortunately, her options are limited to her signature card, Lonnie Ritter, one copy of which is already in play, Leather Jacket, another card that you would rather play than commit due to its combination with Lonnie, Cheap Shot, Daredevil, and Opportunist. She also has two copies of Daring Maneuver, which she can use to succeed by two in a pinch. Apart from anything you can do better, all of the cards I've listed above only have one combat or wild skill icon. Winifred might be able to succeed by two on one or two shots, but it will become progressively more difficult as the game drags on, and she runs low on combat and wild skill icons. And this example assumes that Winifred has Lonnie Ritter in play. Without Lonnie, Winifred will struggle to hit the Icy Ghoul consistently, much less succeed by two. God forbid Winifred is armed with a Switchblade, which provides no combat bonus. Winifred's starter deck is unfocused, and the Succeed by X mechanic is tricky for new players to grasp. To make matters worse, the deck's resource curve is all out of whack. The deck contains a lot of cards that cost 2-4 to four resources, including Lockpicks, the Mauser C96, Lucky Cigarette Case, Leather Jacket, Lonnie Ritter, Cheap Shot, Pilfer, and Slip Away. Playing a bunch of cards that cost a lot of resources wouldn't be a problem if Winifred could generate enough resources to pay for them. She is a rogue after all, and rogues are spoiled for choice when it comes to resource generation. Ironically, Winifred's starter deck contains less resource generation than the Harvey Walters starter deck, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Winifred's resource generation is limited to two copies of Sneak By and two copies of Mauser C96, both of which are conditional. Sneak By requires Winifred to take an evade action, while the Mauser C96 requires her to succeed by two on a fight action, I will never understand why Watch This, a rogue skill from the Pallid Mask Mythos pack, wasn't reprinted in Winifred's starter deck. Speaking of reprints, the designers made a few dubious choices while picking cards for Winifred's starter deck that don't do her any favors. Switchblade Zero from the Corset is a terrible card for Winifred. 
If it's difficult to succeed by two with the Mauser C96, it's next to impossible to succeed by two with the Switchblade Level Zero. Opportunist Zero is another weak card from the core set that didn't need to be reprinted here. To be fair, there aren't that many great Level Zero skills in the Rogue card pool, but either Quick Thinking from the Undimensioned and Unseen Mythos pack or Watch This would have been so much better in this slot. Since they decided to stick with Opportunist Zero, at the very least they could have given Winifred the option to upgrade to the Superior Opportunist 2 from the Undimensioned and Unseen Mythos pack, but that's not in the cards either. Daredevil Zero, a downgrade for Daredevil 2 from the Point of No Return Mythos pack, doesn't make a lot of sense in this deck either, given that it can only target itself, Winifred's signature card, Opportunist or Nimble. It's nice to see a level 0 downgrade for Streetwise, which originally appeared as a level 3 card in the Blood on the Altar Mythos pack, but Winifred's starter deck doesn't generate enough resources to leverage it effectively and pay for everything else. The same goes for Pilfer, which costs a whopping 4 resources. I'm all for cards that let Winifred investigate using her agility, I just don't see how she's expected to pay for them with such limited resource generation out of the box. Some of the upgrades included in Winifred's starter deck are also suspect. I'm not sure why the designers would include a card like Liquid Courage level 1, which does very little for Winifred over, say, Lockpicks level 1, which is a rogue staple. On the bright side, Lockpicks level 1 has been reprinted in the revised core set, so it's readily available to new players. I'm also surprised the deck didn't include Daredevil level 2 from the Point of No Return Mythos pack, which is vastly superior to its level 0 counterpart. Failing that, the deck could have included cards like Momentum Level 1 from the Search for Kadath, or Another Day Another Dollar Level 3 from the In the Clutches of Chaos. Anything to shore up some of the deck's weaknesses. If I haven't made it abundantly clear, I really dislike Winifred's starter deck, and I think it does disservice to an otherwise exceptional and fun investigator. My biggest fear is that new players will struggle with the deck and walk away with the impression that Winifred sucks. The Rogue Card Pool sucks, or worse, the Arkham Horror LCG as a whole sucks, when nothing could be further from the truth. Winifred's starter deck has its fair share of problems, but they're not indicative of the investigator or the game. For all of the problems with Winifred's starter deck, it does include a bunch of new upgrades that may be of interest to her as well as other investigators. Let's dig a little deeper into Winifred's options once she earns a few experience points. Mauser C96 Level 2 is slightly cheaper than its Level 0 counterpart, and it gives an investigator the option to ready the Mauser C96 and gain a resource if they can succeed by 4 on a combat skill test. And you thought succeeding by 2 consistently was going to be tough. While a rogue investigator like Tony Morgan from the Dream Eater cycle might be able to succeed by 4, Winifred will struggle to clear that bar unless she picks up Daring Maneuver Level 2. Lucky Cigarette Case Level 3 is a solid upgrade for a great card. Not only does it drop the Succeed by X requirement to 1, it also becomes the rogue equivalent of the Old Book of Lore from the core set. If drawing a card is good, searching the top X cards of your deck and drawing the card that you want is even better. Winifred's starter deck includes upgrades for many of the level 0 events, including Cheap Shot, Slip Away, and Pilfer. Each of these events are slightly more powerful, and they give you the option to return them to your hand at the end of your turn if you succeed by X, where X is usually 2 or 3. Backstab 3, an upgrade for Backstab level 0 from the core set, works in a similar way. While the option to return these events to your hand is nice, Winifred's starter deck doesn't really generate enough resources to take advantage of them. Pilfer 4, for example, still costs 4 resources. Winifred might be able to pay for it once, but paying for it twice is going to be a struggle. That's where Chuck Fergus, O'Banion Driver, comes in. Chuck Fergus is a 3-cost ally that costs 5 experience points. He has combat, agility, and wild skill icons in the ally and criminal traits. As a response, when you play a tactic or trick event, you may exhaust Chuck Fergus and choose two of the following effects. That event gains fast. That event costs two fewer resources to play. You get plus two skill value while performing a skill test during the resolution of that event. Chuck Fergus has two health and two sanity and takes up an ally slot. Given its plethora of expensive events, Winifred's starter deck seems to assume that you will be upgrading to Chuck Fergus as quickly as possible. With Chuck in play, Cheap Shot and Slip Away are free, while Backstab level 3 and either level of Pilfer cost 1 and 2 resources respectively. 
Then you get to decide whether that event is fast, which is great for generating action advantage and avoiding attacks of opportunity, or whether you get an additional plus two skill value on the subsequent skill test, which improves the odds of succeeding by X. If Chuck Fergus is on the table, the thought of playing backstab level three multiple times per game doesn't sound so crazy after all. Chuck Fergus is a viable addition to an event heavy deck, but there is something you should consider before you purchase him for Winifred's starter deck. If you purchase Chuck Fergus, you're probably not playing Lonnie Ritter, since the starter deck doesn't include a copy of Charisma. However, without Lonnie's passive plus one combat skill bonus, Winifred's odds of succeeding by two consistently with the Mauser C96 take a significant hit. If you purchase Chuck Fergus but you want to keep on fighting with Winifred, then you should probably consider upgrading to Mauser C96 level 2 to compensate. But if you purchase Mauser C96 level 2, upgrading the events will have to wait, and playing powerful events is the reason you purchase Chuck Fergus in the first place. One option is to pick up Charisma so you have Chuck Fergus and Lonnie Ritter on the table at the same time. Fortunately, Charisma was reprinted in the revised core set. That said, two copies of Chuck Fergus and one copy of Charisma will set you back 13 XP, which is a significant investment before you can upgrade your events. The other option is to jettison Lonnie Ritter and the Mauser C96, relying on your combination of events such as Cheap Shot and Backstab Level 3, and Winifred's superior agility for enemy management. There are four other upgrades in Winifred's starter deck that are worth discussing briefly. Manual Dexterity Level 2, Sharpshooter Level 3, Copycat Level 3, and the Beretta M1918 Level 4. Manual Dexterity Level 2 is a solid choice for Winifred, especially if you plan to leverage Winifred's superior agility. If you commit Manual Dexterity Level 2 and anything else to a skill test, you get to draw one card with Winifred's ability and two with Manual Dexterity Level 2 if you succeed, which is fantastic. Manual Dexterity Level 2 is also a viable target for Daredevil, although you'd be better off picking up the level 2 upgrade from Point of No Return Mythos Pack if you want to go that route. Sharpshooter Level 3 has generated a lot of debate in the Arkham Horror LCG community. Some players think it's decent, while others consider it to be a trap that's not worth the experience points. I haven't had a chance to build a deck around Sharpshooter yet, but I certainly understand why some players think this card is a trap. The first issue is that it is conditional on having a firearm in play. This creates all sorts of messy timing issues that are, frankly, annoying. On the one hand, if you draw the firearm before Sharpshooter, the firearm may be ineffective, since the Investigator probably doesn't have the combat skill value to leverage it properly. As we discussed earlier in this episode, this certainly has the potential to be an issue with Winifred and the Mauser C96. Investigators such as Monterey Jack, Safina Russo, and Trish Scarborough are in the same boat. They may be a crack shot with Sharpshooter in play, but much less so with your typical firearm. On the other hand, if you draw Sharpshooter before the firearm, you face the prospect of spending an action and two resources on a card that is effectively blank until the firearm hits the table. That's not ideal either. Giving Sharpshooter the permanent keyword would have alleviated a lot of these issues, but perhaps that proved to be too good in testing. The second issue is determining whether Sharpshooter's bonuses are worth the effort. Rogue and off-class rogue investigators have a variety of ways to boost their combat skill, including talents and allies, and many of those cards have broader applications than Sharpshooter. Lonnie Ritter, the ally included in the Winifred Habit Mock starter deck, is a good example. She provides not only a passive combat skill bonus during all skill tests, but also a lot of soak and an interesting healing combination with Leather Jacket. Sharpshooter just improves your ability to fight with firearms and its bonuses are conditional on the investigator and the enemy. If you compare Sharpshooter to Lonnie or Delilah O'Rourke, a rogue ally who provides passive combat and agility skill bonuses with the ability to convert resources into direct damage against enemies for the same amount of experience as Sharpshooter, Sharpshooter begins to look very narrow indeed. That said, quite a few rogue investigators, including Winifred Habamok, Monterey Jack, Safina Russo, and Trish Scarborough, benefit from attacking with their agility skill instead of their combat skill. Couple that with the fact that many enemies have lower evade values than fight values, and those investigators' odds of succeeding by X improve significantly. Winifred Habamok and Monterey Jack, for example, have 5 agility. If either of them is firing at an acolyte or hunting Night Gaunt from the core set with a 41 Derringer level 2, their modified combat skill value will be 5 or 6 greater than the skill test difficulty before they pull from the chaos bag. 
that's a pretty good spot to be in if you're hoping to succeed by three to take an additional action. If Winifred or Monterey had to use their combat skill instead, they would need to commit a lot of cards and or resources to have any chance of succeeding by three. I think you could make the case for playing sharpshooter in these situations, but again, it's conditional on drawing the right enemies at the right time from the encounter deck. Frankly, I'm not a big fan of cards that force you to jump through a lot of hoops, and sharpshooter is like a bloody obstacle course. Finally, there's the sad fact that sharpshooter exhausts, so it's good for only one shot per round. That's going to be a problem if you're confronted by an enemy with more than one or two health, or worse, a boss in multiplayer. Even that pesky hunting nightgaunt from the previous example has enough health to shake off sharpshooter. Sharpshooter is non-unique and doesn't require a slot, so you could have two copies in play, but that's four resources and two actions, which is going to be slow. Unfortunately, I'm not convinced that Sharpshooter is worth three experience points. I can see what the designers were going for in theory, but the execution seems like a misfire. Sharpshooter might be worth a look in the right rogue armed with the right gun, but more often than not, I'm probably just going to end up disappointed by it. Copycat is a rogue skill that costs three experience points. It has a wild skill icon and the gambit trait. After you commit Copycat to a skill test, search the discard pile of another investigator for a skill you can commit to this test and commit it. After this test ends, place that card on the bottom of its owner's deck. Obviously, Copycat is only viable in the multiplayer format, and its value is conditional on the skills in the other investigator's discard piles. That said, I think the effect is pretty neat. Most investigators play at least a few powerful skills that would be worth copying depending on the skill test. If I'm investigating, perception and deduction immediately come to mind. Ditto for overpower and vicious blow if I'm locked in combat with an agent of the mythos. I'm not entirely certain that I'd be willing to spend 3 to 6 experience points for this type of effect on a lark, but it could be quite valuable if you coordinate a little with other players in your group. You could certainly be spoiled for choice of skills if Min or Silas are at the table. The final upgrade in the Winifred Habamock starter deck is the Beretta M1918. It's a 4-cost rogue asset that costs 4 experience points, it has 2 combat and 1 agility skill icon, and the item weapon, firearm, and illicit traits. It enters play with 4 ammo. You may exhaust the Beretta M1918 and spend 1 ammo to take a fight action. You get plus 4 combat and deal plus 1 damage for this attack. If you succeed by 2 or more, either ready the Beretta M1918 or this attack deals an additional plus 1 damage. If you succeeded by 4 or more, do both. Beretta M1918 takes up two hand slots. I've never played the Beretta M1918 or its counterpart from the Lost in Time and Space Mythos pack, the Chicago Typewriter. If I'm playing solo, I can't really afford to play a weapon that requires both my hand slots because I need my lockpicks. If I'm playing a rogue in multiplayer, I usually focus on investigation rather than enemy management. That said, if you're playing a combat-oriented rogue who has a back plan in the event your gun jams, the Beretta M1918 offers a huge combat skill bonus and big damage. Earlier in this review, I mentioned that Sharpshooter might be viable with the right gun. The Beretta M1918 might be that gun. Ideally, you'll want to succeed by far to ready the Beretta and deal 3 damage, which means you need a modified skill value in the double digits. If Winifred Habamock encounters an enemy with a stat line like that of the Relentless Dark Young from the core set, while she has Sharpshooter and the Beretta M1918 in play, her modified combat skill value is already 7 greater than the skill test difficulty. Commit a card and or resource to the skill test and Winifred is all but guaranteed to succeed by 4 on standard difficulty. If Winifred does get a second shot, she won't be able to trigger Sharpshooter since it's exhausted, but she still has a modified combat skill value of 7 before she pulls from the Chaos Bag thanks to the Beretta's massive skill bonus. Winifred will need to commit cards and or resources to the skill test, but there's a good chance that she'll take down the Relentless Dark Young in two shots if she does. Unfortunately, one bad pull from the Chaos Bag and the Beretta M1918 will remain exhausted. In the event that happens, Winifred can fall back on her 5 agility to escape. Again, I'm not entirely convinced that Sharpshooter is worth the XP, but it can help give investigators like Winifred a significant leg up in combat against certain enemies. I've talked a lot about the myriad of ways the Winifred Habamock starter deck comes up short. 
Before this video draws to a close, I'd like to give you a couple of examples of Winifred Habemock decks that should fare better in solo or multiplayer. First up is a better version of the starter deck. This deck uses cards that are available in the starter and the core set. The 41 Derringer replaces the Switchblade, while Flashlight replaces Lockpicks level 0. I've cut one copy of the Mauser C96 and Streetwise to make room for more skills, including Guts, Overpower, Perception, and Unexpected Courage. I've also trimmed the event package substantially to lower the deck's cost curve. The resource generation in this deck isn't quite where I would like it to be, but I am reluctant to cut cards for emergency cash because it lacks skill icons. I'm also dubious of Daring Maneuver level 0, but it does have a wild skill icon which would go a long way to helping Winifred pass a willpower skill test in a pinch. Once your card pool expands, you have more flexibility. This Winifred deck is based on a build proposed by Ian over at Mythos Busters, and it includes many of the cards that I've talked about in this video. Flashlight, Intel Report, Perception, and Unexpected Courage help Winifred discover clues, while the 25 Automatic and 41 Derringer are there in case Winifred needs to kill an enemy rather than evade it. Gregory Gree, Lone Wolf, Faustine Bargain, and Watch This give Winifred several ways to generate the extra resources needed to leverage cards like Streetwise, while Lucky Cigarette Case and Pickpocketing help Winifred draw cards. The deck contains 13 skill cards, so Winifred has plenty of options to commit to skill tests. If and when you pick up the Edge of the Earth Investigator expansion, you can experiment with a card like Underworld Support. It reduces your deck size by 5, but you can only play one copy of each card. This forces you to play cards that you may not have considered before. Fortunately, there is enough depth in the Rogue card pool to compensate. For example, you can't play two copies of Intel Report, but breaking and entering is a viable alternative. One of the most important issues that you must address whether you're playing Winifred in solo or multiplayer is her abject lack of willpower. The previous decks use a combination of Hit Me, Money Talks, Anything You Can Do Better, Guts, and Unexpected Courage to deal with cards like Frozen and Fear, but there are other options. If you're playing a low willpower rogue like Winifred in multiplayer, you have a couple of options to deal with willpower treacheries. You Handle This One from the Forgotten Age is standard issue in multiplayer rogue decks. Guardians and off-class guardians can take willpower treacheries off your hands with Let Me Handle This or rig the draws from the encounter deck with First Watch, while mystics and off-class mystics can cancel them with Ward of Protection level 2. As I mentioned at the top of this video, Winifred doesn't have a lot of great options to show up her willpower at level 0, at least she didn't until the release of the Edge of the Earth Investigator expansion. If Winifred picks up in the thick of it, she can purchase a combination of Counter Espionage 1, Savant level 1, and Moxie level 1 or Moxie level 3. Counter Espionage has two willpower skill icons and enables you to cancel and redraw a treachery. Better yet, if you've got the resources to spare, you can draw a card from your deck or help out a friend in need. Savant level 1 has four wild skill icons if Winifred commits it to a willpower skill test, which even gives her a shot at dealing with the tough willpower skill test on a card like Crypt Chill if necessary. Moxie, on the other hand, is a great way for Winifred to shore up her willpower and intellect. Moxie requires a fair number of resources, and you've got to find a way to protect it, but it can work wonders in the mid to late game. I've used it to great effect in Winifred in scenarios like The Secret Name, which has no shortage of willpower treacheries. That's going to do it for my look at Winifred Habemock, the Aviatrix. Honestly, I can't say enough good things about Winifred, and I have really enjoyed the time that I've spent playing her. It's a bit of a shame that her starter deck doesn't really suit her all that well, but you can improve it a lot even if you only have access to the revised core. But now I'd like to know what you think. What has your experience with Winifred been like? Let me know in the comments down below. Thanks for watching, and stay tuned for more great Arkham Horror LCG content. That's going to do it for this episode. If you enjoyed what you hear, remember to like, comment, and subscribe. If you need to contact me, I can be reached at manfromlang at gmail.com. I'm also on Twitter at manfromlang. Until the stars are right, keep your shotgun close and your elder sign closer. Take care out there, and happy investigating.